Welcome to the Hallenstein Center's new online program, Lunch and Learn. I'm your host, Gleaves Whitney. During our stay home order, we may not be able to journey far beyond our homes, but that should not stop us from journeying far beyond our minds. Today's journey takes us deep into our nation's healthcare system. Our guide is Brent Reed. Brent is a recent graduate of our Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy. He recently earned his Master of Health Administration from GVSU and also works full-time for Mercy Health and the nationwide Trinity Health Network. He is passionate about leading the American healthcare system through constructive change and will discuss his experience of leadership in a crisis, helping with everything from virtual care to personal care. My conversation with Brent will go, oh, 20, 30 minutes, followed by questions from our viewers. Feel free to begin sending your questions to us right away using your Zoom toolbar to do so. Brent, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Glee. Well, first of all, congratulations on your recent graduation, but what a way to emerge in your career right in the middle of a pandemic. Oh, I know it, it's been a crazy ride and you know, going from not even being able to walk to jumping into frontline management of health career services has, has definitely been an adventure. Well, we'll be getting into that in just a moment. As I mentioned in the introduction, you just earned your master's degree in healthcare administration. What have your education at Grand Valley and your experience at Mercy Health and in the community prepared you actually to do? Oh, it's, it's prepared me to do so much, Cleve. The, the reality is without this level of education, especially in moments of crisis like now, when unprecedented things happen, people pause and don't know what to do, right? And it's places like GBSU that prepare you to be able to lead and to enact the knowledge that you've gained into real life. And being able to lead and do a positive impact for change moving forward is really the goal of any education in my mind, right? And uh, my, my education uniquely has prepared me uh, because of my background. Uh, originally, I am not from Michigan. I grew up all along uh, kind of the West Coast. I actually ended high school in Alaska, in Anchorage, Alaska, but started high school in Las Vegas, Nevada. I uh, moved around a lot during my youth, and then in college, I went to my undergrad at Brigham Young University, um, where I worked in an IT department uh, and while studying to become a dentist uh, and actually uh, getting a business degree. And then I ended up uh, moving to North Carolina before we moved here. Um, all of these, these things that I've been learning throughout my life have really led me to where I am today, and, and I would be remiss without expressing gratitude for that preparation. And yet it's not inevitable, is it? I mean, you were a dreamer, literally, and uh, you've told us a little bit about what you were doing before you came to Grand Valley, but very specifically, when you were in North Carolina, Brent, as we've talked, you know, you were preparing to become a dentist, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, you have this dream involving your father. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's one of my favorite stories to tell. And, you know, I think even before I tell it, the, the lesson that I've learned from it is you never know uh, what opportunities might present themselves and in what forms. So uh, originally, like you stated, I was in North Carolina waiting to start dental school. Um, I was actually working as because, you know, in life, you never know. Uh, what types of jobs you can do. And I knew I was about to start dental school. So I decided to take a job in the, a sheriff's department. And I was working 12-hour uh, shifts, night and day shifts, in a prison uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, just waiting for dental school to start. And I started really reflecting as to whether or not all this preparation for dental school was what I really wanted to do with life. And in the midst of all of this reflection, I did have a dream, and in this dream, and it was very vivid, uh, I was sitting next to my father in a classroom, and we were learning something. I didn't know what we were learning. I just knew that I was sitting next to him, and it was very apparent that we were in school together. Now, some background on my dad is uh, it, 15 years ago, he completed his MBA program, which took him 10 years to complete. And I remember when he graduated with his MBA, 
he swore he would never go back to school ever again, uh, just because it took so much time and it was hard on him and us because so many nights and weekends were gone. With that being said, the vivid, the, the cognitive dissonance that created in my mind, I, I had to call my dad that next morning and I said, Dad, I've had the craziest dream. You and I were in school together. What do you think of that? And he told me, he said, Brent, it's crazy that you called. Last week, I applied and got accepted into GBSU Master of Health Administration program. You should apply. Just see what happens. And uh, since that day, so many doors and opportunities happened. I decided to apply and and things just happened so quickly and effortlessly that it, it seemed like it was the right thing to do. And six months to the day of me having that dream, I found myself uh, sitting in a classroom right next to my dad, uh, receiving our first instructions from Dr. Raymond Higby at GBSU. And I can't tell you how my life has changed from that moment um, of deciding to follow that dream that I've had. And um, it, it's really changed my life. Well, we're really glad that you made your way to Grand Rapids and Grand Valley in the process. And while your education, your experience, and your training in healthcare administration have prepared you for your future, there are other stories I know that you can tell us about really getting your hands on experience with healthcare. Uh, you, you tell a story about your wife, for example, your brother. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so. Uh, specifically with my wife, this, this is an interesting story, and I don't think we talked about this, uh, but a lot of people don't realize I have three kids, and um, my exposure to the healthcare industry when, when Heather was pregnant with our first child and was actually due, uh, I got to know we had a family practitioner. Uh, his name was Dr. Peterson out in Utah, and he didn't do very many births, so at the time when she was in labor, he just ended up spending the day with us for for that uh, for that event. And he asked, he turned to me and he asked, he's like, "Brent, would you like to help?" And I was like, "Absolutely, Doc, if it's cool with Heather." And uh, throughout the day, he gave me a, a mini day of medical school on how to uh, do labor and delivery. And because of that, uh, and obviously the wonderful patience of my wife, I've been able to uh, deliver all three of my children, um, you know, as, as we've had them. And it's been a wonderful experience for us. And that was really my, my first big exposure to the hospital system um, and to, to primary care physicians and, and the knowledge and, and capacity that they have. I also had the opportunity uh, to work with my brother in this IT department where we developed and created software platforms that we spread across the university. Uh, and that knowledge combined with, you know, the, the exposure that I had to those settings with my wife and being able to deliver our children really prepared me to have um, some of my own perceptions on what healthcare was and, and how we received it and what patients may or may not be looking for uh, just through my own anecdotal evidence. Now, GBSU and my preparation helped me uh, formulate a more evidence-based perception of what patients are really desirous for and, and the type of care that providers can provide uh, so that my own biases and prejudices weren't as prevalent in my desire for change, you know, something that could be more expansive and applicable to everyone. And because of that, uh, when COVID started, I was actually tasked to uh, start and, and implement and then operationalize a video visit platform across the state of Michigan so that our providers could have the means to communicate and treat our patients virtually. Well, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you're now working on the front lines. You're integrating so much of what healthcare providers are able to deliver during this pandemic through virtual care. Help viewers understand really what virtual care is. Oh yeah, that's, that's a great question. So uh, there's a lot of terms that get thrown around in the news nowadays. Uh, virtual care and telemedicine uh, tend to be synonymous, uh, though there are some distinctions that get broken down between the types of care that you can receive virtually. The first one is called asynchronous. 
And that's where you email your provider, you wait 15 or 20 minutes, they get to it, and then they email you back uh, with, some, with some prescriptions that they could fulfill. You might be able to send them a picture, um, but it's not real, real live interaction. And then something else that people don't realize is that it's also considered telemedicine is telephone calls. So let's say you call a, a provider over the phone and you reach the nurse and they're able to either refill a prescription or, or set up a, a visit for you or provide some level of care. Right now, that's considered telemedicine as well. What I was tasked to create was to build a video visit platform. Um, some of you might have heard on the news that some doctors are using Facebook or Time or Zoom in order to be able to visit their patients. We needed to create a system that enabled our providers to be able to do that as well, to interact with the patients, but it also needed to have uh, a more further view of how uh, video visits would work in the future. So right now, people don't realize that there are a lot of regulations and compliance issues that surround video visits, which is why, for large reasons, they weren't fully implemented across the United States before COVID. A lot of those have been waived, allowing providers to do whatever they need to do in order to be able to see patients, which is a wonderful thing. However, as we, as life begins to normalize, you know, and as we start to combat this virus while still having to take risks and, and opening up our country, we're still going to need to limit uh, interactions at places like doctor's offices because that's where the sick tend to congregate. And, and it's in the healthcare system's purview to make sure that everyone stays moving forward. With that being said, we wanted to create a video system that fully integrated into our patient records so that the patient could not only have all of the access that they need to to all of their medical history, but also so that the provider could provide the highest quality of care at the same time. And so this is the type of virtual visit that, that we created uh, with a long-term strategy in, in mind so that we we wouldn't have to stop doing these video visits once uh, everything opens back up again. How widespread is this going to be on the other side of the pandemic? I mean, how fast can it grow? The, te oh, yeah, the telecare. Oh, that's, that's another great question. So it, it could become in, so previous to COVID, some organizations that were early adopters in video visits had seen uh, approximately 25% of uh, their total in-office visits turned into video visits because it seems if it saves time, it saves money. There's a bunch of research out there right now that shows that patients are able to receive the same level of quality of care for some of those video visits as they would if they were in an in-office visit, which is really exciting. And the other, but on the flip side, there's one organization out in the Southwest in Arizona where they do 80% of their visits are actually done virtually. Uh, and they're able to provide specific uh, help to their patients uh, over video phone where they end up educating their patients on how to better take care of themselves as well. And the other thing that, that a lot of people have been talking about is what does this mean for anxiety and depression and for patients that uh, typically uh, get missed or that don't necessarily have to come into the office because of, of mental health issues. And there's a, a study that was just published that said patients um, who experience or who've been diagnosed with anxiety and depression tend to be more honest and open with their providers over a video visit than an in-office visit. And this was actually related to the fact that when you're in your own home and you're in your pajamas and you're able to speak with a provider, it's under your own terms, right? And you're able to have those walls break down and, and really open up to providers to let them know how you're doing. The, the reality is for, for probably 90% of anxiety and depression visits, those could be done virtually, especially if they offer improved or enhanced patient outcomes than coming into an office. So that's, that's some really exciting things um, just initially. And then long-term, there are, there are hundreds of companies right now that are building medical devices that would allow you to receive different types of services from your own home. You know, otoscopes, those things that they shine in your eyes or they shine in your ears or your nose. Uh, a lot of those can be connected to Bluetooth. And if you had one, 
um, you could connect it to a video visit and the doctor would be able to see if you have an ear infection or, you know, if you've got something in your nose or if you've got, uh, you know, swollen uh, tonsils. So the, the impact of, of COVID and the, our ability to serve patients better moving into the future is, is going to expand for sure and, and be enhanced. You know, that's, this is fascinating how technology is going to help the patient, empower the patient in all this process. But I, let's get back just real quickly to what you were saying about those who are suffering from, uh, you know, depression, uh, just mental illnesses because of the isolation that this pandemic and the lockdowns associated with it have caused. And, you know, it occurs to me, Brent, that we have got to do a better job, not just explaining to the public that we've got to fight the virus and get the economy going again. I mean, that's been basically the polarity we've mostly heard. It's also tending to the people who have had difficulties, you know, coping, uh, the, the depression, for example, anxiety about this. So anything that we can do along those lines, I think would be a, a big help and welcome news. I, I was delighted by what you just said, for example, that people at home can be more open with their healthcare providers and take those risks because it's on their terms and say, you know what, I'm struggling, got anxiety, got a lot of depression right now, help me. So that, that's, that's great news. Now, you work with them, you're, you're researching needed change in our healthcare system. You've already given us a little glimpse into that. You've even attended a conference on the matter uh, with sponsorship through the Cook Leadership Academy Independent Initiative Program. So in your eyes, what are some of the priorities so what are some of the things you would really want to change once uh, you get a little bit more experience? And how do you envision yourself playing a part in that change? Oh, that's a great question. The, the big thing that I'd want to change is people's ability to access the right kind of care when they need it. Uh, education is, is, is a, a terminal, and I don't want to say a lazy way that we that we often hear that we just need to increase patient education, but it, it is so important and you can't downgrade um, the desire of providers to educate their patients. And the main reason is, and this is what I would want to change, is to create pathways to patient empowerment. So it, it's not just about being able to access your provider, it's about being in partnership with them. You know, not having a provider tell you what to do, but work with you to help you change your life. And, you know, the expertise that we have in the medical field needs to transition out to people in their day-to-day -day life. And, you know, a big way of doing that is, is creating um, not only protocols on the medical side of things, but also policies and legislation that supports it. Uh, a lot of times what we see is there's this, this triangle uh, between insurance companies, the government, and then the healthcare system. And it, and it really doesn't include the patient a lot of times in these policymaking decisions because we've taken responsibility away from the patient and just given it to insurance companies and providers being regulated by the government. So uh, if, you know, in, in my dream, what I would be doing is I'd be empowering us to live our best lives with partners in our community, community with us, the healthcare system. And I, I'd have the government get out of our way so that we'd be able to do that. Um, and, and part of that dream is, is, is being able to lead a health system in performing that. One of the, the downsides to the industry is that because of the way we're set up, everyone is so risk averse. You know, everyone, a lot of people are afraid to, to push uh, the boundaries because it's such a volatile environment. But someone's going to have to do it, right? Someone's going to have to lead the charge and be engaged and really make a strong argument towards people having the capacity to take care of themselves and that we should be pushing that uh, so that they can, they can have their own agency in dictating how they live their life. So... That might be long-winded. Uh, hopefully that made sense. No, it does. And what I'm thinking as you're speaking, Brent, is that this is a great cost savings measure too. The, the more we can get into this whole idea of virtual care, telecare, uh, making the patient feel more like a partner with the healthcare providers and in the system, that actually it's going to result hopefully in cost savings. 
your research, your analysis to date, is that an accurate assumption? Oh, it, it's an extremely accurate assumption. I mean, even now with the advent of virtual visits, our opportunity, so just from COVID and the advent of video visits, it's shown that we no longer need to have as many physical buildings, right? Which decreases cost immediately to the healthcare system and decreases burden. The other things that video visits do too, from a health perspective, um, and I'll, just, I'll do it from the provider perspective and the patient perspective. For providers, we don't have to have um, as many MAs cleaning and decontaminating rooms and setting up big physical exam rooms when we do video visits. And that sounds like a little thing, but that takes up a lot of time where we could reposition some of our medical assistants and clinical staff who we always have shortages of uh, into doing things but like taking care of some high risk population, people who have something called comorbidities where they have multiple diagnoses uh, that make them very vulnerable, especially during times like this, we could reallocate resources to focus on those individuals that are really driving up the cost of healthcare because they have to utilize the healthcare system so often. Uh, and that's just on the provider side. Um, for patients, for the way that you and I would feel the impact of the cost savings is we don't have to we don't have to take a half day off of work anymore to go see the doctor. We, we don't have to drive to the office to have to um, sit and wait for a doctor that's 15 minutes behind, which means we as a patient have to sit there for 45 minutes, uh, you know, in our day waiting for them in a waiting room or in our exam room to, to be able to get to us. All, all of those, the, that lost time um, really goes away when we're able to do things like video visits. So, you know, if we're able to, to move this way socially, I think it would help a lot of people in a, in a lot of different ways. Hey, well, you mentioned waiting rooms. I imagine waiting rooms are one of the most, you know, toxic places to be in terms of spreading germs. And you know, imagine everybody, uh, no one was social distancing in waiting rooms that I visited, you know, over the years. Well, you know this question's coming, Brent. I uh, very much want to know what your experience at the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy was like for you, and specifically in terms of how did it help you and change you, your vision of leadership? Oh, that's another great question, Gleeve. So specifically with the Cook Leadership Academy, one of the things that I took away that inspired me the most was the example of Ralph Houndstein and and his focus on how values lead or breed leadership. And I, that's something that I've tried to incorporate into my own life. I'm a big proponent of transformative leadership and servant leadership, which are our, our two models uh, of leadership to follow. And, and those are based off of, if you want to be a good leader, you have to know who you are and what you stand for. Because if you don't, you become subject to the whims of those around you. Uh, and with, whether or not your values um, are the same uh, is less important than that you have them, right? Because then at least there can be more conversation with regards to what the right thing to do is, and you'll know where you stand. And uh, so that I love, that was one of my major, uh, I don't know, philosophical uh, favorites of the Cook Leadership Academy. Um, in addition, I can't express how fortunate I was to be able to go. So you mentioned earlier that I was able to get that scholarship to attend um, the, the summit for young health leaders uh, in the country put on by the Advancement League in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, or in Durham, North Carolina. And the ability, uh, so the timing, I had three other conferences that I was supposed to go to this year. And the only one I got to go to was the CLA initiative, independent initiative. And because of that, I was at the epicenter of the COVID outbreak in Raleigh, in Durham, uh, two weeks prior to it hitting Michigan and had an idea of what was going to happen uh, where we were just because I'd been there. And I'd seen and conversed with people who were real time interacting with the disease and some of the measures that they were taking. And it directly impacted my ability to serve our community here in Grand Rapids. So, so even just those two circumstances, um, I would not have been able to have without the Coast Leadership Academy, which I, I'm very grateful for. And then the, the camaraderie and the, the fellowship of, 
of being able to to meet all these wonderful leaders was was also a high benefit. Well, you just made my day. No, my week. So thank you for that. <laughs> How important is a mentor in this process? You know, that's one of the things we really emphasize at the Cook Leadership Academy. We assume you're going to have your academic mentors here in the university, but we also place a great deal of emphasis on your having a community mentor. Tell us a little bit how important your mentor has been. So my mentors, I've, I've had several that I identified during my time with the Cook Leadership Academy, and uh, they've, they've been essential. And the reason why is sometimes you need a reality check on your own uh, views and perceptions of how things are going. And a lot of times you don't get them with those that are immediately around you. Uh, you need a safe space to be able to, to throw ideas off of someone and to know that there, there's no other agenda. You know, you're not losing face with anyone. You need to have a, it's, a mentor is also a confidant, you know, someone who's going to help guide and direct you um, without there being any adverse reaction or, or or assumed poor intent, right? Uh, and, and if you don't have that, sometimes, um, especially when it comes to leadership, you might be doing things or thinking things that in your mind, you've convinced yourself are great leadership tactics or great values. And when in reality, they're not coming across the way you might want them to. And, and I say that specifically, so when we were rolling this out, a lot of people don't realize change management is, is so important. We, in addition, you, you speak earlier about the mental health of individuals during this time. We had some providers because we had to furlough workers. We had to close down offices um, for the time being. Uh, we had providers or doctors who were in tears because their family, uh, who they worked with, they were no longer able to work with. And there's this big question as to how long is this gonna last? Are we gonna be able to open up again? Are people gonna come see the doctor? Um, and, and that fear, you know, is very overwhelming, not only for patients, but for, for providers as well. And if, if you are taking too hard of a line, you know, so we, we did this, we did this training where we were really excited to to share with everyone the fact that these video visits we're going to and this is a mistake on our part right uh, and again the need for a mentor we we share with everyone that their efforts were going to be the result of us being able to bring back our furloughed workers because we were going to do video visits and we were going to start being able to see patients and bring revenue back into our organization which would then allow us to to bring our people back and our families back and for some people, it was too much. It was overwhelming. And here we thought we were being inspiring and, you know, you know, motivating everyone. And then when we ended up having some in our audience brought to tears because it was a lot of pressure, uh, you know, we had to do a gut check. And I had someone that I was able to speak with to kind of get that feedback from. But if not, they would have just gone and we were able to go and speak with them and Kind of ease their fears but if we didn't have uh, if i didn't have a trusting mentor at that time um to kind of walk through that step i, I probably would have missed it um and made that situation even worse than, than i had already done by by putting too much pressure on people does that make sense yes it does let me change registers just a little bit with all your work as a full-time graduate student and a full-time employee of mercy health trinity uh, you also have three young children. I think you have a, what, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a nine-month-old at home. Yep. Brett, how do you balance your very successful career while being an active member of your family? That's a great question. It, it's hard. <laughs> I'm not going to mince, I'm not going to mince words. It's, it's difficult. And what I found, um, I've, I've read a lot of leadership books recently. And uh, there, there are some common themes, but one of my favorite is one by James O'Toole. It's called Creating the Good Life. And it talks about the need uh, to, to follow all the best advice and to learn how to lead your own life, right? And uh, one of the things that I like to say is instead of creating balance in life, you need to create harmony. Because in life, I've realized it is very, very difficult to balance. Right, because the the weighted 
priorities is constantly oscillating, right? Sometimes at work, you're required to spend more time. And other times, you know, especially when I was having children, I needed to have the flexibility from work to spend time with my family so that my family's needs could be met and uh, make sure that they're aware that I love them and, and care about them and that they're just as important and in reality more important than anything that I could be doing, um, you know, career-wise. And uh, what I learned in this book was you, you have to know when to take a break and appreciate the respite and focus on your family. And you also need to know when you need to put it in overdrive at work and do things that it takes in order to be successful. And, and that requires harmony because everyone needs to be on the same page. If it's just a balance, um, you know, things rarely stay on a 50-50, you know, percentile, you know, all the time. And, you know, I think it's one of the great misses. If you want to stay happy, you know, happiness isn't found just at work, you know, or your success. It's not a, it's not a, a lasting a way of finding meaning in life, at least in my opinion. Well, that's an opinion that I think more of us could benefit from, Brent. What do you dream of doing that would be the capstone of your work and career? Your life as a family man. Uh, my so my dream, my my first and foremost dream is to be a good husband and father uh, to my children. I don't think that there is no success at work that um, can compensate for a failure in the home, right? And I believe that being successful at work. Is, requires that you have responsibility and and prioritization in the right way. My my career goals are I want to be able to have the biggest impact possible and help as many people in my community as possible without losing my family. You know, and without losing those precious moments where, you know, I'm teaching my children how to ride a bike. I am, you know, uh, spending time with my beautiful, perfect, amazing wife, Heather, and um, being able to enjoy the best things in life, which I, I think can be found outside of, uh, of career success. With that being said, you know, because of my work now, I've, I've been exposed to lots of executives where it takes, it's taken a lot from them and they've had to make sacrifices. I just don't want my career to force me to sacrifice my family. In the end, my, my ultimate dream of success is to be able to lead a healthcare organization that shares those values of family and community uh, so that, you know, we can all, not just myself and my organization, but all of the employees and all of the patients can benefit uh, from the best of both worlds, you know, and find harmony in doing so. Right. Worthy goals. Well, we have viewers queued up to ask questions, so let's bring them into our conversation, Brent. One viewer asks, we've heard a lot of how this pandemic has changed your work. How has this affected your family? Well, that's a great question. So, uh, so my sister and my brother-in-law and their children all got COVID. Uh, they're in California. Um, they're okay. They're okay. They, there, was, there was a little bit of a scare there for a while. Um, and then I actually either but um in our earlier conversation but my other sister i just found out um is getting quarantined because she's so she's not she's been exposed and and dealing with that um i don't want to focus on the negative though i, I think there's been a lot of positives and a, and a lot of blessings that have come through uh this time for my family uh we are very fortunate so i don't there i cannot say enough how grateful i am that uh, we are in a, a stable position. I know so many other families are experiencing death and experiencing hardship, either because they've been furloughed or let go. And there's a lot of instability in the future. So, you know, for me and my family during this time, even with some of the illnesses that have happened, uh, people have recovered. And we've actually gotten closer together as a family as a result of it. We actually last Sunday, we did a, a Zoom meeting, which has been great. We did 
a Zoom meeting with all of my cousins and aunts and uncles and my grandmother for, for Mother's Day. And we shared like family stories, you know, it's something we could have done this entire time, but it took COVID uh, to really get us organized and come together as an extended family to, to reconnect. One, wonderful. So how do you think telehealth will impact the patient load of our doctors and healthcare providers? Hopefully, so that's a, that's a great question. It could increase the number of patients that a provider could take care of. So for example, I don't know how familiar everyone is with something called patient panels. Um, but typically, uh, providers, uh, a doctor, based off of the type of insurance that they accept, will, will bring in a certain number of patients, whether it's 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 patients that they might have that fills their their day-to-day -day schedule. Um, sometimes, now with a lot of different regulations, there are a higher patient volumes that a provider needs to care for in their community in order to to stay solvent. Um, with the advent of telehealth, a provider is actually able to see more patients um, in less time because of the whole piece of trans, uh, transportation and cleaning and disinfecting rooms. Uh, we actually tend to have a shortage of doctors in rural areas. Um, versus like city areas because that's where physicians tend to congregate. Our ability to see those who might be underserved or might not be able to see a doctor that lives close to them because the doctor doesn't have a panel size that's big enough where they have to travel somewhere else. Video visits can, can significantly impact that moving into the future. So I hope, I hope that we're able to keep them. This will be a related question then. We have a viewer asking for those who have limited technological resources or skills, for example, maybe they don't have a laptop or Wi-Fi or smartphone, that kind of thing. What is the latest thinking on ways telehealth can reach those folks? That's a great question. That's something I think about every day. So we are on the same page. We should talk. The, uh, so the first thing is for those patients that have zero technology, we have to bring it to them, right? And we have to find ways of engaging them in, in a safe way. I'm, I'm specifically thinking of homeless populations and, uh, and really uh, the underserved in, in poor socioeconomic areas. Those are the most at risk. And actually, if you're looking at the numbers for Grand Rapids for COVID cases, where we're having the biggest um, surge of cases tend to be in those areas among the homeless population, or among uh, lower socioeconomic uh, uh, neighborhoods. And, and in, a lot, in a lot of ways, that's because in those areas in Grand Rapids, people tend to live a lot closer to each other and, and may or may not be receiving the, the same messages that we are on TV. Uh, so the first thing that we've done, at least to engage those populations is I'm actually, we just got uh, some funding for Mel Trotter, which is um, a, a clinic downtown that helps see a lot of homeless population. We're actually getting them outfitted with devices so that uh, patients can still go there, which they do today, but then also do physician consultations um, using telehealth video visit platform right now. So that's one way we're going to reach out. And then the second way is I'm actually in Shelby, Michigan right now because uh, our providers in this northern network uh, experience in Oceana, I learned only about 57% of people in this county have access to that, and in some surrounding counties, as low as uh, one in three don't have access. So, you know, there'll be a 30, you know, 7% uh, internet rate. And so, for those patients, we're actively working to find ways to reach them. The main reason is if if they have a cell phone, we can reach them, right? We we We've actually augmented our platform to have two modes of communication. One is uh, if they have a smartphone, we can reach them if they have cell signal. If they don't, we're actually looking for resources where we can set up telehealth pods that are in specific community areas that people could go to and then receive a telehealth visit without having to drive 45 minutes, 60 minutes to a clinic uh, in order to receive their care. We have another viewer who's asking, what 
other books would you recommend? And I'm glad the question was asked because you've gone on a program of reading lots and lots of leadership books in the last year. I think your latest count was. So uh, yeah. what would you recommend out of that big batch of books? So of all the, of all the books that I read, um, my favorite one was one called The Multipliers. So you'll notice that when you read lots of, biz, of, of leadership books, back, this is my takeaway. Um, a lot of them get homed down to the same value them, where you, you are the person, uh, but a lot of the anecdotes or the stories that they tell in these, these visits are necessarily generally applicable, and not all of them talk about the need to constantly um, do leadership upwards and downwards in your organizational structure. So not only do you know peers, not only do you need to know how to lead your family, you need to know how to lead your leaders and provide them the right information um, at the right time so that they can be those leaders as well. And Liz Wiseman's book, Multipliers, really breaks down that everyone has the ability to lead. Uh, it's just there are specific things where we're not good leaders, and there are specific times when we're great leaders. And it's, and it's about finding the best how we go around. I'm not into micromanagement. I'm into, well, transformative leadership. It's we, we educate and uplift and edify those below and above us and at the same level so that they take ownership and do well in their own because they have autonomy. And multipliers, the premise of the book is the leaders know how to get a multiplication out of the productivity of, of those around them. The people that are going and they extract the genius that is inside every single person uh, because each of us have so much to offer and it's not about the leader. It's about the team. You know, it's about the group and, and extracting all of the genius that can be had within that group to find the best outcome. So that's why Multipliers is my favorite book. Very good. Anything else you wanted to tell us about before we uh, wrap up here, Brent? Uh, I'm grateful to be able to, to be on this forum and grateful to you, please, and, and your leadership, um, you know, throughout this experience. I, I would just add, I think don't doubt your capacity for good, right? Uh, there are so many of us, you know, especially in times of crisis that tend to look inward, um, which is natural, which is fine. And you have to, you have to take care of your own responsibilities. And, and that makes sense. Uh, I would add that in addition to that, those during crisis, like our front health, our frontline healthcare workers who are able to look outside of themselves and really show the best of humanity I think those are the kind of people that we should um, put on platforms and elevate and, and try to be like, because if we all can act that way, then we'll all be able to, to not only get over this crisis, but to walk into a better world post COVID. So those are just my parting thoughts, please. Well said, Brent. Thank you for sharing your story and inspiring our viewers with your passion for delivering the very best healthcare possible for people in need. The people who've tuned in can now see why you are such a highly regarded person at our Hallenstein Center's Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy, and we wish you the very best. Thanks also to our viewers whom I invite to Zoom in or join us on Facebook at the same time Tuesday, May 12th, when my guest will be Jeff Paulette, a political philosopher at Hope College who has also been a featured speaker of ours at the Hallenstein Center. Till Tuesday at 1 p.m., stay tuned and stay well.